So um, basically, I have I have this talk. You don't even know the title of it yet. Um, I'm call, I call it um, Curiosities in Multidisciplinary Crypto Studies. So um, multidisciplinary crypto studies is this idea that actually like cryptography is sort of a tech focused, you know, very math heavy, computer science heavy sort of science. But actually through blockchain and through like a lot of research I've done over the years, I realized actually it's not so simple. It isn't just some, like a tech uh, disciplinary subject. And so, but really this is like a tech conference. So my, my talk really is tech curiosities in multidisciplinary crypto studies. So coming at it from a multidisciplinary perspective, you know, what do, what, what do we, what tech insights or opportunities or stuff can there be sort of, sort of what, what are sort of like, I call them curiosities. Like what is it sort of, um, um, what have, I, what have I been sort of like begged to ask in computer science that maybe you wouldn't if you weren't a multidisciplinary researcher, but if you were just focused on computer science. So I'm gonna have like a, a big list of curiosities and I'm gonna go through them one by one. And uh, hopefully at the end, you'll, you'll see the value of multidisciplinary crypto studies as opposed to just sort of single disciplinary cryptography. Um, and also, you know, thinking about this in terms of computer science a little more broadly also. Um, so firstly, let's start with that topic. So um, right now I'm gonna do basically multidisciplinarity between media theory and computer science. So maybe you guys have heard of media theory. Media theory is a study of media, not necessarily what the like the mainstream news says, but like the mediums in which we, we express ourselves. You know, I gave a little uh, nod earlier to like the difference between the visual and the spoken sort of auditory mediums, but there's many different mediums actually out there. Um, you know, visual as in light, visual as in written text, which is sort of a recorded spoken text. Um, there's basically, you know, in computer science, we have like bits and qubits. It's kind of embarrassing. There's they're sort of, uh, we could call it functional analysis science, or sorry, uh, um, function evaluation science. Sometimes, in some aspects of theoretical computer science, almost like functional evaluation um, studies. Almost sometimes. I mean, I am I am trolling a little bit, but basically, even if you move out of the functional world in computer science, you move into this rewriting world that we're so rich in here, where basically you know you have like some text and you're rewriting text. So in computer science today, we're really 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 founded on the written tradition, the written text, the 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 the, the string of characters in an alphabet. That's where functions are defined. That's where the entire study is founded. And today, if you want to do something in multimedia crypto studies like let's say you want to do like a audio only authentication of an audio stream or video only authentication or, or encryption of a video stream you can't really do it you the, the 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 written medium is so far advanced you have to go and encode it bits in there and then decode the bits and sort of you you put writing in there if it's audio if it's video it doesn't really matter even the quantum bits thing they're, they're bits to us um because we come from a tradition of strings of characters written in an alphabet and that's like the basis of computer science that's the mediatic basis of computer science today and sort of like the curiosity then in this sort of media theory slash computer science research is you know what about the audio computer what about the visual computer what about like a quantum computer that isn't based in bits in this classical you know as if it's like a spring you know language uh, thing and it's very interesting because like different medias have very very different properties and we might imagine why Crypto and computer science may be different in different media. For example, sound takes time to hear, and it's very easy to add sound together into the same space. Whereas visual medium, sometimes there's like layering and opacity issues. It's kind of non-trivial to add things together. Also, you know, with a with a with a string media, sorry, with a language media, written text media, you you kind of have to like you, you have like append, right? Sort of like we append for the most part. We just like append onto the giant string, which is like the state of our computers, like. It, like in, in some way an operating system is like a, a string for managing strings you know it's not really like it's sort of like very much based in the string tradition uh, dri like linux drivers are just streams you know um the way that the operating system sees them and so like even the operating systems abstracts away any possibility of other media just from just like a, because this, this is the history of computer science basically but different media have different properties uh, just in terms of their efficiency composability the operations you can do on them so you can imagine the future, uh, you know, multimedia cryptography, multimedia computers could be, a, you know, it's curious. It's curious that we, we were stuck on this path, that we came on this path of 
the written text as sort of the canonical foundation of computer science. So it's like a curiosity that you may not think about if you're just doing pure computer science research, but if you do a little media theory, you suddenly, you know, the written text seems so oppressive. It's so, so has so much power. It's like the written word is like you're writing a extension to the Bible almost. It's like, it's straight up like comes from the tradition, like the printing press came from printing the Bible because like Luther wanted the Reformation, you know? It's sort of like the history of it is sort of writing religious texts. And it's, it's almost as if when you write a novel, you're writing doctrine into like the Christian religion or, you know, a Judeo-Christian or whatever world. And so the that history sort of comes down into computer science. Um, and uh, sorry, I don't remember. I thought, what was, what, where was I going with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, 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 so we, we just got stuck with this uh, because of the history of, uh, of writing and writing is so strong. It's so hard to imagine almost how we would express ourselves or do computation without serializing everything and deserializing everything, encoding and decoding everything back into strings of bits or, you know, strings of some other alphabet, if you will. Um, and, and there's an issue to that. One of them is the, the fact that like, oh, computer science has such a hard time with concurrency. Maybe is related to the fact that the medium is so serial. I don't know it could be right like you have like a string of strings still a string unfortunate um so uh let's go on to another curiosity so here i um am going to talk about some multidisciplinarity between securities law and computer science so not securities law but securities and like finance and economics sort of economics let's say and and computer science uh, and talk about something called uh, computational securities so computational securities are these very, very interesting type of security. So you've heard of securities, I hope, uh, you know, stocks, bonds, uh, derivatives, uh, you know, options, futures, all, all, any kind of like sort of financial product is kind of a security. And um, I mean, like literally is a security. And then, and, and so computational security is, is an interesting question. Uh, let's, let me give you my favorite sort of example to introduce people to this topic, basically, which is, uh, you know, the Turing test. We always ask, oh, can we? Sorry, the halting, the halting problem. Like, can we ask, like, you know, will this halt? Like, this is something we always ask, right? What we should be asking sometimes, actually, is, is there a program around there who can sort of perfectly hedge away the possibility of it not halting and sell us a, a halting security, which, by virtue of the, this program interacting with this other program, sort of makes it halt. Imagine it may not halt, but it's a distributed system, and in the context of some other interaction, it would halt if that interaction went a certain way. So you could have, for example, not the question of does it halt, but is there someone who can sell me a halting security? Or maybe to sort of techify it and move it away from the economics, not sell, but just, just sort of send me one as a message, you know, that says, okay, yes, like, you know, because I'm going to continue to engage in this behavior, like this program will halt. Um, so this is like a sort of like a distributed halting problem where actually buying a security or Finding a security, selling a security, having a perfectly hedged, a per, like a perfect strategy for hedging all the possibilities where the program doesn't halt, sort of is very interesting and close to one of the problems that we sort of hold dear in computer science. You know, does it halt versus will someone sort of ensure or speculate or guarantee or in some way, uh, you know, both, right? Both speculate and guarantee uh, that it halts. And like, you know, like, and that, you know, taking this economic perspective, like, you know, is it competitive? There's a lot of, is there a lot of people? What's the price of that? You know, is it hard to do this hedging strategy? Um, these are sort of like very, very good questions, but we can expand this scope out of just will the program halt. But like how long will this program take to run in the operating system in this current session? You know, um, there's many, many cases where there's non-determinism and uncertainty about the execution of programs in the future and where other programmers interacting with them can monitor and influence their timelines and executions. And actually, um, securities are indispensable in economics for, for organizing uh, the economy. I mean, you can't imagine economics without organizing the economy. I think one day we won't be able to imagine computer science without computational securities because, like, we're going to organize computers better than just like a string of bits that says how the strings of bits, uh, the strings should move. You know, we're going to have actually like speculation and also hedging and guarantees that are provided not by just pure analytical uh, ex anti-analysis, but also based on uh, continual interaction with the system. Uh, so you do the ex-ante analysis, but you have to continue the program running, otherwise you're wrong about your hypothesis. Uh, or like, you know, your security is unhedged, and therefore you maybe like are out of money because you have to pay someone out of like a, 
you know, whatever, like your prop portfolio, sort of like a sort of hedged portfolio. Yes. Some securities actually come with some legal language right around that makes them conditional, right? You get a security only if, you know, there is some vesting schedule and only, only if something happens in the company and only if, and so on and so forth, yeah. right? So that's, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, the, so there's not, be that's really right. So, so, so I, I talked a little bit about this, like perfectly hedged security that like, well, definitely, you know, if the person runs the hedging strategy, it'll definitely help the computer. But many times, yeah, there's risk and you need to understand the risk that like, oh, if so-and-so happens, then actually this, the security's prediction or payout or whatever won't happen. And so understanding the risk is really important. The securities markets, the securities law is all about making sure that people are buying and understanding what these, these products are, are, are knowing the risk. And, and so, you know, there are going to be just, there are going to be also very speculative and with lots of risk, but still very useful. Um, and that's something also we're not really used to in computer science, like a promise that's like sketchy, that is still useful. is sort of weird. We don't really like that. Normally we think about like, oh, well, we want the worst case to be good too, you know? Um, but in, in sort of like computer science, it's turned, I mean, in economics, it's like commonplace, very, very commonplace for people to have like a security where there's just risk and you don't know that there's like someone perfectly hedging around the other side. And there's all these different scenarios. Like, for example, Credit Suisse last week, uh, if in case everyone was following, uh, they had like some bonds that people didn't expect, even though it was in the terms, would be uh, sort of less, uh, let's say, uh, senior than. Uh, equity, which is not, not normally how bonds work, but these are like special bonds to like go bankrupt first or whatever. Anyways, so so now, now, now I'm gonna take this a little bit uh, to a place of like maybe more pure tech, which is uh, also kind of a computer science curiosity, which is time travel. Uh, time travel is like a really cool and important thing actually, um, it turns out. I mean, and securities kind of do some time traveling for you if you know, they, they're all about speculating about what will happen in the future. You do some planning based on the, um, let's say, resources and systems that are marshaled in order to make good on the promises of those securities. Um, but you're sort of acting with expectations on what the future will be. And But imagine if we were to actually know exactly what the future was. You know, that would be very useful, actually, in our computation. If we, if we, if we knew now what the future was in the future, uh, then we could uh, maybe you know, achieve much more efficient programs. Um, there's a there's a neat paper um, from 2008 uh, that shows that uh, closed timeline curves uh, make quantum and classical computing equivalent for like at least complexity class stuff. And so like, you know, um, somehow, you know, a, quant a classical computer being able to receive messages from itself in the future, like its actual future, um, makes it much more efficient uh, in many, 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 many classes of problems sort of exactly the same ones where quantum are efficient, which is sort of interesting and, and, and kind of makes some intuitive sense just because like of electrons interacting with themselves in the future and stuff like this. Um, so basically there's a sort of a, this question about what computational traces are like admitted as like a real computation. Like we start from the initial state and only take like a, a sequential sort of trace with a finite, with a, with a finite trace with like, um, or, or do we allow this sort of loop of time travel, uh, and 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 if you do allow these, these sort of like uh, computational traces with uh, all the fixed points that are possible, starting from like let's say, um, start, starting from the from the initial states, but 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 but, but allowing uh, uh, these sort of uh, time travel traces, um, you get sort of a lot of po time travel possibilities, and it depends on your theory of computation. Um, and some of them are sort of much more forky than others and will allow them with many more types of time travel. Um, like right now, uh, we're, uh, Nisa Tran and I and others are, are working on this VLSM theory, which involves uh, equivocation, where basically timelines are sort of effectively splitting. Uh, and this allows for many, many more kind of possibilities for time, time travel because you can not only time travel sort of within the same timeline, but between different timelines. Uh, and it's still sort of like a computational trace. And uh, that means that sort of, uh, you know, it, if you can make the computer run this according to this one paper, which I sort of like take to heart, um, you know, we can get some tremendous computational savings. Uh, and then the question is, okay, in some way, you know, how do you time travel? Like, how do you get a computer actually to, to do this time traveling stuff without, without the quantum bits? Um, and we have, um, we, have, we, have, we have some, we have, we have like kind of an answer to, for that actually. 
for now. Anyways, uh, at least within Ethereum, at least within a short duration, uh, which is uh, it's basically um, I, I call it like smart validation, uh, smart transactions, smart semantics. Basically, it's a uh, it's it's an it's, a, it's sort of a computational paradigm where instead of validating a uh, computational step based only on the current state or the like even uh, sort of what's available to the computer now, it's sort of able to somehow uh, look into the future state, like look in the future actual state that it actually is going to have in the future uh, and validate the current transition based on, based on that future information. And there's a number of ways to implement this. Um, the simplest one is a speculative execution, where basically you'll speculatively execute in order to check that at that later step, this thing that you guessed happened at the first step actually happened. And if it didn't, then you revert it. And you sort of like a lot of pre-processing, just do this a lot. Eventually you'll get it right. Uh, and then you sort of like have sort of the speculative execution trace, which happened to behave like it's uh, time traveling. Okay, that's a little bit computationally expensive. Uh, could you could you take the microphone? Yes, I cannot resist uh, to make a connection here with coin induction as a as a proof principle, right? Because when we do proofs by coin induction, the mental model is that okay, I have to prove a property. Guess what? I'm going to assume that property. <laughs> And now I'm going to continue to prove it, assuming it. And then into the future, if I need it, I use it, you know, because mm -hmm. I already assumed it. And and the fact that you cannot prove yourself wrong, that's a correct I prove by co-induction, right? So uh, I'm assuming it, and now I'm trying to prove it. And if I don't run into any problem, it means that my assumption was correct, so the property holds co-inductively, which is a bit surprising. But I think uh, and just if you're able to prove it. Is. Hmm? You have to also prove that you can't prove it's negative, or you just prove it positive. No, you just prove it positive. Okay, that's the thing that you, the thing that you assumed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems very relevant in the sense of very related in terms of like the computational trace looks exactly the same. Uh, however, it's much more clever also than like the brute force approach that I described, because you sort of know what you want to prove. You have like sort of like you have this uh, like prophecy or maybe one day like computational security of like what you're gonna get, and then you sort of like use that to to get it actually, and sort of this. A self-fulfilling prophecy sort of becomes a thing where basically, like, um, you know, it, it, there's actually many possible traces I could be seeing from the future. I like will choose a nice one that lets me prove what I want to, or or lets me have the computation that I want to. Um, sort of uh, time travel is in some way anti-causal um, because uh, you know when you get when there's sort of like a, there's a non-deterministic choice of which future we choose now. That's sort of like a function of the future and not the past is sort of is sort of anti-causal um and, and and sort of or let's say like um non-causal or 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 just just non-causal so this is so the the, the non-causal nature of these sort of like uh like like sort of like I, I like call them like leaps of faith or um uh, maybe conductive proofs uh sort of is uh very very interesting also from this point of view of like a classical what's like what's wrong with classical com com computation right and like why can't it do the quantum stuff well in some way the causality in quantum is much more confused uh, than uh, the causality in classical computing which is sort of like one step at a time the past cost the future very very sort of mechanical um in like traditional newtonian mechanics sort of way of the, of the, of the word um so basically this uh this 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 sort of idea of time travel uh sort of um leads to this idea of uh, smart validation as a way to implement it within sort of at least the the uh, at least the distance from which you're able to speculate speculatively execute or in ethereum we have this sort of uh, the mev land where basically uh there's like a searcher who's searching for the possible uh ways that the program could go and sort of there it's sort of like a speculative execution but like a little bit more strategic and you know trying many 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 of them in maybe a more strategic way than just sort of like i described earlier where we sort of randomly tried uh, to like guess what would come in from the future. Uh, so the searcher is like much more clever. They know they're looking for this coming from the future or something like this. Uh, or, in the, or you know, I, I guess like today the, they don't really do this time travel stuff, but they easily could because they sort of have the whole timeline and they can see at the front of the timeline and the back of the timeline what happens and they can give the information from the front to the back. Sorry, from the back to the front by just like uh, passing a message in, you know, assuming that it doesn't disrupt the the fixed point, uh, uh, because like it might be that the computation earlier changes what happens later in this grandfather grandfather paradox thing, where you go back and kill your own grandfather and therefore you're not born, um, kind of story. Um, 
And so, and so actually, uh, in today, uh, blockchains actually are undergoing a lot of disruption because of MEV, actually. And this is a lot of uh, some of the area where some of this research came out, um, basically because the nature of like what a blockchain is is undergoing significant change as it is no longer sort of disintermediated peer to peer per se as much as much as it ha you know there's like there's like there's like medi mediators that are sort of entrenched and enforcing uh international sanctions rules uh but not all of them and 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 sort of there's a number of mediators doing this at different levels of the of, of the sort of flow between transaction creation and, and execution um and so actually there's a like there's a there's sort of like a a big thing happening in blockchain right now which is like the nature of blockchain is changing even without uh the the technical specification changing at all, uh, and it's changing in like a deep counterintuitive way that sort of is met with a lot of resistance by a lot of people, especially in the public, because uh, you know they're not very technical and they understand that this is a threat to the blockchain they know and the way they interact with it today. And sort of um, this uh, this leads me to like a, another sort of um, very interesting curiosity in sort of like multidisciplinary. Uh, crypto studies, which is which is the the um, basically the fact of um, uh, I won't call it like alchemy, theurgy, theology. Basically, there's a kind of uh, let's call it uh, 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 performative, uh, ritualistic uh, thinking that has to do with sort of like the um, you know like how we use the blockchain how we relate to it what does it mean to us what are we using it for like uh, like you know like what do we see it doing for us in the future uh you know like and 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 actually it can be changed without changing the technology at all it can be changed deeply and ex in ways that are make it a very very different kind of institution we, i talked a little bit about time travel well, that's going to be a trip right I MEV mean, stuff was already sort of a trip like the 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 change to the transactional semantics and the change to the transactional model uh, didn't require any blockchain sort of change, but it did require some people thinking about like, you know, sort of and doing this like literally like alchemy or theurgy where they sort of change what the blockchain is under everyone's feet without changing the technology at all. And this sort of like leads me to this, to this other curiosity, and I can expand on that like sort of a lot, um, which is that like blockchain is not tech. So I mean, it really sort of flies over tech people's sort of I'm saying this a lot of time, but it's it's super duper not tech. Blockchain is like a multidisciplinary institution. It's its own very complicated institution. It's 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 it cannot be um, understood as tech, deployed as tech, developed as tech, invested in as tech, uh, competed as tech. Like you know, you see all these tech projects trying to be blockchains, and they just repeatedly fail. You know, like every single professor coin ever almost has failed because of this, because like they think it's technology. It's not technology. Um, it's political, legalistic, economic. It's like uh, crypto uh, in the sense of like uh, like uh, uh, like cypherpunk and like crypto, like in this political motivation of like let's like well, you know uh, replace corrupt authority with protocols. It's sort of um, uh, a blockchain is like a really complicated institution actually, and. To understand it as technology is to miss the point. Okay, well, the easy thing to see is okay. Well, the the, the coins need to have a price, or it doesn't work. And that already sort of makes it economic in a way that's sort of foreign to computer science for the most part. You know, what does it mean for it to have a price? Not much in computer science. It sort of means a lot in uh, in, the, in economics. Um, and it's not just that. Like, I mean, what is a smart contract? You know, like that's not a tech thing. I mean, it's not. It's not like smart in the smart validation sense that we talked about earlier, which is similar to like smart products the way they see in the future. It's not a contract. You know, like what is this thing? It's not just a piece of code on the blockchain. People use it in a very specific way because it's called the smart contract. Also, there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding, dead end theorizing also because of this term. And so, you know, blockchains, you know, aren't tech. Smart contracts aren't tech. Uh, but smart contracts also aren't contracts, and they're not smart either. Um, Vlad, is it okay if we ask questions? During, please do, um, yeah, yeah, please do. Please. Because yesterday in the panel, um, we were discussing about challenges and opportunities in the blockchain, and people raised the problem of regulating blockchain, and I think it fits uh, to the point you got. So what's your opinion? Or, yeah, or I mean, the easy thing to say is that like blockchains are highly legalistic institutions. They were like set up from the start with a very, very specific sort of like legal constitution and strategy and like modus operandi. Um, and they are, you know, and like Bitcoin sort of 
shows it with the immutability. Ethereum shows it even more with the smart contracts. And you look at the read the yellow paper or the white paper, it's like, you know, like a foundation for like a, a like crypto society almost. It's like very, very ambitious sort of political legal project. Um, and to understand this tech sort of will mean that like you don't you're not you can't even go to market because you don't know what the market is, right? You don't you won't succeed because you know, if, if you don't have the legal structuring, if you don't have the economic structuring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's many different sort of axes that need to be lined up and which sort of always have been in every successful blockchain because of the sort of, um, because that's the nature of the beast, basically. Um, and so, like, yes, uh, crypto law is a huge challenge today. And in particular, because of the legal institutions that were placed into the blockchain from the start, like immutability, what is that? I mean, like, legally, that's just so dumb. I mean, like, what is something that can't be subject to dispute and can't be changed by the law? Like, nothing. That doesn't even exist. Like, it's like the law is, like, way stronger than, like, any of these nerds with this blockchain. Like, it'll, like, never, it's, like, inconceivable, inconceivable legally that you would have something that's, like, immutable. That's, like, above dispute, right? And so, like, there's problematic norms that are built into like the core of like what blockchain is but these are like legalistic norms designed for a specific strategy for a limited timeline they won't exist forever and like the law will absolutely uh figure out how to digest this and uh how to how to react i mean there's no question about it um it's just a matter of time more questions maybe um yeah please okay well i could go on a little bit um, so basically, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about smart contracts. Um, so smart contracts, you know, I said they aren't contracts and they aren't smart, right? So like, what would it look like if we, oh, this is curiosity, right? Like, what would it look like to actually have smart contracts? Like, what would a real smart contract be like, you know, like something that's like actually smart in the sense of like smart products or like the smart validation sort of stuff and something that's like actually a legal contract? Well, I mean, there's different contract law traditions in the world. But they all sort of look like uh, performance obligations and sort of like rights that need to be respected. And then sort of people try to uh, do the performance that's the, that the contract says that they're going to do. And if, and if they don't, the contract says sort of like, like, you know, what should happen according to the contract sort of like in those cases. And then it's sort of like the judge and contract law comes and media, mediates all the stuff and says, look, OK, well, that clause was unlawful. Like you can never require that in a contract because like you know who you think you are like you can't you don't have like infinite sort of right to contract you have like sort of very bounded in public law rights to, to contract and sort of um and so and so what would what would a real smart contract look like what would we look like if we if we try to like redesign a smart contract with like sort of like a smart transactional semantics and like this like legal mind of like understanding you know like as much as like a contract law professor or judge or whatever but still more than like apparently the cypherpunks did uh, when the smart contracts got, got pushed over. Um, and, and basically, uh, here's something that I can describe quite relatively easily. Something called a, I call it a flash smart contract, which is sort of like a smart contract that exists all during the course of like the flash time, just like the flash time of like a smart loan, uh, uh, a flash loan, maybe you've heard of it. Flash loan is like a loan that you give out only if it gets repaid, kind of uses this type of a time travel mechanic. Um, and a smart contract is sort of a contract that you only get it into if all the rights and performance requirements are respected otherwise so the contract sort of only forms if during in the flash period all the performance obligations are met then none of the rights are violated you can imagine like formally specifying the rights as like you know properties of this program and the obligations all as like sort of um also potentially as like properties of the program also and so you could um you know you can imagine this all being checked within the flash time and then being reverted if it doesn't if it doesn't doesn't go out and that's sort of like a flash smart contract. And, and so like that's curious, right? I mean, it's not a it's not like a real smart contract in some way because it's it's just a flash one, but still it's still real, it just only lasts a very short time and doesn't allow for any possibility of any of the terms being violated. Whereas like a real contract law like really deals with bread and butter of what happens when the terms aren't respected. Uh, and then and then basically you have to think, okay, well, this piece of code now needs to understand, okay, if all of the if any of the what happens in each of the contingencies where each of the performance obligations or rights are uh not performed or violated for example um and and sort of like the classical thing for a smart contract to do is to like remove balance from a security deposit to basically like take your money um and then you know one day maybe it will arrest you too um but for now it just takes you takes the money that you put in the smart contract um just sort of uh 
you know, I don't mean that in a good way. I mean, that's just sort of like a scary possibility that like sort of like naturally, like legally, like, you know, um, sometimes you can get yourself into contracts where the liability is huge. And uh, it's not necessarily normal that your liability should be bounded to the amount of money you put up to this tech system or whatever. It's totally conceivable that in the future, like the sort of crypto only barrier of smart contract enforcement will be broken. And then you'll have smart contracts sort of enfo enforcing like RoboCop showing up at your door. Um, it's a very, very real sort of possibility. Um, and sort of, um, um, you know, uh, not, not necessarily like related to this like uh, question of like, oh, why, why are smart, uh, like smart contracts being bad, but just sort of a question of, you know, um, the liability that we can enforce using these tools today. So like blockchain today is supposed to be like an island, you know, it's supposed to not be rely on, um, let's say real world enforcement by your local national authorities, by like the cops or whatever judges, law enforcement you can think of. Um, but and that's something that's like built into like the constitution of the blockchain from the start, but like it's absolutely not the case uh, for like, you know, investor protection and creditor protection, uh, uh, you know, scams, fraud, securities, fraud, lots of, lots of, lots of things you can do with blockchain today, like also like theft and uh, lots of stuff you can do that, that will get you in trouble in real life. Um, and that will like, sort of continue and like in the future, like realistically, you're going to be able to get yourself into a, a real world liabilities uh, using uh, on-chain institutions. Uh, and more than just by defrauding people, but also by like, for example, just taking a securities position um, that like involves like potentially getting into a really big negative balance, for example. But um, yeah, please. Kind of happening, right? Because there are companies that move assets onto the blockchain, even apartments, right? We're talking about this thing yesterday. And um, I mean, you become legally responsible for this because, you know, you can lose your house, literally. <laughs> you know, yeah, if yeah. it is collateral to make a loan or something, you lost it. Yeah. Thankfully, the title, is, the registry doesn't recognize it. So it's just, it's just a fraud. Or, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I totally, it's, it's already very, it's already happening. Yeah. It's definitely already happening. There is a company that we are auditing their smart contract for, and that's what they want to do in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah just let people get into like, uh, Home wrecking liability. That's no, gonna be great. Totally home, right? mm -hmm. Yeah, any assets, any assets. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, you know, I mean, um, then the there's usually like pretty sensible uh, limits uh, in terms of like what a judge will enforce in binding arbitration if like for creditor and investor protections that like, you know, like if you screw your creditors and you're not gonna become homeless actually because like the judge will figure out if this is your last home or not. And if it's your last home, they like won't make you sell it. Um, or if it's not too immodest, anyways, they might make you downsize or whatever. Uh, and so, and so, you know, there's there there are limits uh, in the law today, and sort of, you know, we have to wonder how far we're going to push those limits with this sort of like, let's say, naive tech-based approach where we don't even understand like that there are legal limits to contract, that there are legal limits to liability, but we just have like a number, you know, or uh, some kind of tech object that really doesn't deal with that sort of nuance and judgment. Um, and so, you know, like blockchain isn't tech, it can put you in jail, you know, it's like sort of a much more complicated thing. It's not just like using a, a piece of a piece of software. It's like a, you can think of it as like a international securities marketplace. Sometimes, sometimes it's just a international registry or notary. Um, it takes many, many different functions at different, at different sort of times um, if, for like different legal purposes at different actors or whatever. So this is just like legally, it takes many different, different functions. Um, so yeah, so, you know, like uh, it is sort of, um, a real curiosity, you know, you know, how, how do we do smart contract verification, you know, in the context of like this being sort of not just software, you know, what is the additional, uh, like technical context of this software, you know, maybe there, maybe, you know, um, um, you know, maybe formal verification can't actually complete the audit of a smart contract because of sort of the like legal liability, legal judgment, sort of legal analysis, where which today maybe isn't subject to this kind of level of rigor and verification because of the nature of the logic, but also because of the uh, complexity of it. And I think there's the tools maybe just like aren't there yet, but maybe maybe will never be. Um, example, the formal methods community where there was a grant in Japan to formalize the Japanese legal system. Right? So they tried to come up with the actual formal rigorous specification of the Japanese legal system. And it was 
you know, a long project, then it failed miserably. Yeah, it's a disaster. Yeah. Even, even trying that is a disaster. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, but the only reason why this is even attemptable is actually because of the sort of Napoleonic code tradition of trying to have like an impartial state administer the rules. You know, that's the only reason why it's even possible. Uh, without that paradigm, uh, you wouldn't even conceive of this kind of verification problem. So like there's sort of like, there is like a sort of like tech paradigm actually that like a lot of the law is founded in today because of the sort of history of enlightenment. Um, and, and, and it sort of it gives people like the false idea that like law is like code just because of like legal codes, which sort of people like to pretend they treat like code um, because of like historical reasons or whatever. Um, and so like, you know, uh, uh, law is confusing and complex, complex uh, uh, very different actually than tech in, from like a basic epistemic or ontological sort of perspective. I mean, like uncertainty is like deeper and more pervasive and harder to resolve and remove um, than like, you know, uh, in any of these tech objects. And so that's one reason actually why blockchain is not uh, a tech is because like it, it experiences and is subject to a kind of non-determinism that tech is not subject to because of the nature of the disputes, because of the nature of the like law and politics and like high stakes conflicts that are happening in and around these things. Um, so, um, so I mean, I'm sure I have more curiosities, um, but uh, I feel like I, I feel like I went through all my list here, and uh, so maybe I want to like see if you guys have questions. I'll look at the time, make sure, and then budget. <laughs> Great. Sorry. Where was it? Oh, there. Okay, great. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it, it, uh, I would like to see if I could feel some questions. And if not, maybe we'll, uh, maybe I can do like an example or something. How do you relate game and game theory right, ah. with time travel? Because when you play you know, a game of chess, right, so you kind of time travel for a while, right? See what happens in the future and how, how do I best the choice in the present based on that? Yeah, so it's a very, very good question. And the, the sort of lucky situation that we have in MEV is that sort of like the search plays last. And so like the searcher is kind of like the last player that plays and the, the one that decides sort of in which order everyone gets to play their strategies. So imagine sort of like everyone submits their strategies and then this like other player orders all of them. And if they submit like a smart time traveling strategy, it's still up to the uh, last player to order all of them and to make it all sort of causally work out. And so basically like the, the answer today is like, oh, there's another player that works out all the non-determinacies and, and race conditions and, and just chooses sort of based on their own optimization for their own profit, uh, which way that game is going to play out. And so in some way, um, you know, everyone plays their strategies and then there's another player that decides how it all, how it all fits together. And I think the, but the reason why this is sort of challenging is actually probably more because of the uh, lack of concurrency in game theory than um, because of lack of time travel. Um, because like game theory, even a race condition in game theory is like, oh, what do you do? You have to kind of pull this kind of trick also um, because like of like, you know, the sequential or simultaneous move games, um, you know, tradition where like there is no concurrent move games almost like to come up with concurrent moves, you have to be like one of, you know, a small number of people independently sort of doing it. Um, and so the, the, and then concurrency with faults can kind of like lead time travel. Um, where basically you have like things happening in parallel, but maybe also racing a little ahead and messaging and backwards in time. Uh, sort of concurrency is like sort of different timelines happening, you know, in parallel interacting. Um, uh, and sort of, a, uh, I think, like, you know, concurrent game theory would be a good intermediate step before time traveling game theory. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe there is interesting game theory there um, because like, you know, these sort of contingent smart strategies are, are, are sort of interesting. Uh, whereas like uh, a dumb strategy that doesn't respond to how the player, last player orders them, um, maybe is a little less interesting. You know, you, you play like rock or paper or scissors or whatever, and then the, the players decide which order versus, you know, you play rock if it's after scissors, and et cetera. Um, so they give you these sort of like contingent strategies. I mean, there may be very interesting theory there. Um, however, like all the game theory that I know becomes very intractable very fast. Uh, and so I would also not be surprised if like it's a nightmare and uh, analytically like you take it takes some seriously heavy lifting. We need like another von, Neum von Neumann to, to do this maybe. I don't know. It's fine.
Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a turn based game where the AI knows when they're playing and stuff like this. It's interesting. I mean, I look, I, I, um, I don't want to talk about AI. Uh, it's one of my least favorite topics, especially now that everyone's talking about it. Well, we also have a talk about it. Um, I also have a question for you. Uh, for example, so we have um, a lot of students uh, in attending also this workshop and yeah, they are still, still maybe some in the search of their path and what would be your guideline for them if they try to go on the path of the blockchain? You said it's okay, don't take it necessarily as a tech, but what would be your advice? Um, how to uh, enter in this field so that you don't feel overwhelmed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, that's a really tough question. I mean, it's sort of, I guess, um, I guess it's good to have a plan and not to be sort of like uh, pushed around by like sort of like causality and have like a specific sort of like, here's sort of what area of the space I want to get into and here's sort of why. Um, because like, you know, it's very easy to, if you don't have that, be sort of sucked into the prevailing, uh, let's say, politics. Uh, it could be that you're already in the prevailing politics and you just want to, you know, like uh, 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 decentralize the banks or whatever the whatever whatever centralized sort of corrupt uh, thing there is, but it could be that you're just sort of like a tech student and you want to do and you want to just like do innovation in tech stuff, and 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 you're not interested in the political aspect of it. Uh, in which case, you're sort of you you do mean need to make, maintain some like constant vigilance and, and discipline, because like that politics is sort of interwoven with the technology at a very deep level at a, the, all the education about it um you have to basically like learn to inoculate yourself against this virus like sort of thing so to speak of this like uh, crypto politics and it's sort of um, not easy at all um and, and so like you know i guess like you know the basic advice is like okay well if you're not into it for political purposes you know you should keep your political guard up because like you'll be suckered into it by accident and then you know you'll be contributing to some regime which maybe you don't want to be. Uh, you know it's better to sort of know the basically it's a media thing also like you should know the mediums in which the crypto people publish and what they read and 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 if you don't want to contribute to their political agenda you don't don't publish there don't don't like let them take it you know what I mean um, because like sort of if it's a good idea and you put it in front of the right person like they will just they will just take it and sort of adopt it for their own political ends and this without tremendous amount of work there's very little you can do about that um but the best thing you do is like sort of you know publish in academic papers and and, and then they, they'll, they'll never read it almost uh and you know i'm not saying that's like i'm not saying the academics won't i just mean the the like applied crypto people won't. um and so you know it may, it may be better to politically like stick within your community if you're not trying to become like a cypherpunk revolutionary sort of person um but this is just sort of like in let's say practice maybe not in the way people carry themselves right it's like sort of People act like, oh, this is all, you know, just tech innovation as like a sort of Trojan horse for the revolution, you know? And so it's easy to like uh, uh, forget about the revolution when you're focusing on the tech also. And then basically my advice is, okay, well, you know, unless you want to be involved in revolutionary politics, like don't be accidentally, you know, like don't be accidentally involved in revolutionary politics. It can be problematic. Uh, and also, but there's also a lot of get rich quick stuff that you probably also don't want to be accidentally involved in. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in crypto that like, you know, if I was just a tech researcher that I, I would like hopefully uh, be well advised to avoid because it's like, you know, a tech researcher isn't going to be super keen on political uh, propaganda or legal analysis. They may not be even able to detect the fact that immutability is not a technical property, which is sort of a... Very common thing, and sort of like the uh, part of the institutional setup of blockchain is like to make you believe that it's technically immutable, uh, because then like you know you like won't try to change it or whatever, and that's like a, a legal strategy. Or whatever. Um, so you know, um, you know, be careful. Uh, uh, but but I will say one thing also, which is that Satoshi Nakamoto did something amazing. Uh, he you know in this complicated institution did create technology that was you know qualitatively. Uh, uh, very different and much simpler, uh, much more accessible than uh, Paxos, and much more scalable in certain ways than Paxos. And so, in some ways, there's like this whole Paxos tradition in computer industry systems. This being that sort of, in some ways, 
um, a one-upped by Satoshi Nakamoto because he sort of like went to production on a bigger scale than any of those systems ever did and sort of have with architectures that's much much easier to understand or much easier to think you understand uh, and sort of like the, so like a, someone learning it feels like they get it and and they actually could implement it relatively easily compared to Paxos and like Paxos is somehow like a normal example for students but it's a nightmare I mean I don't know I don't really like wish it on anyone um, if you could look at the blockchain instead because it is like really that much simpler and so like from from pedagogical perspective like blockchain consensus is easier than Paxos and like you know i think that people will benefit a lot from that in the future also in terms of like development because like uh, developing and so it's easier to develop uh blockchain also than paxos also like uh changing paxos is like relatively hard changing blockchain is like relatively easy just because of the um i guess the simplicity of the specification like, at the end of the day um so the satoshi nakamoto did a very amazing thing but including a tech innovation that was that is very very significant in the world of distributed systems and, and computer science uh and cryptography even also and so you know not have like this zero knowledge explosion thanks to like people wanting to prove things to the blockchain um you know it, it has had a tremendous impact in accelerating development in certain tech areas and um you know for some that's a tremendously positive thing um and you know i think for like a distributed systems scientist or researcher or a student especially it's especially especially a good thing you know if you're a senior scientist you're going to be a little miffed because then people don't understand how much better paxos is or whatever um but uh for the most part yeah i think uh the, the satoshi did create something that's very good from learning like i actually like learned cryptography and computer science sort of after learning bitcoin and like how bitcoin worked you know, like I sort of like um, got into crypto and distributed systems from like crypto because of Bitcoin and like hashes and signatures. And then distributed systems because eventually I was like, oh, proof of work is bad. We got to do proof of stake. But then like, well, what happens in the system or whatever? And so actually like um, the blockchain is like a really good entry point into these uh, these areas. And so it can be very, very useful pedagogically. And also it can be very motivating also for a student who is a revolutionary student uh, to, 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 to to learn about it because like, oh, look, you know, like, it's political change motivating uh, thinking, oh, you know, I'm gonna take the system down or whatever. It's kind of irresponsible, by the way. But uh, uh, the, the, it, is, it can be very motivating to be saving the world or doing something that you see you feel is purposeful, um, uh, which sort of like blockchain has because of the sort of straight to disruptive production model of, it, uh, of its uh, um, history. Thanks. Um, are there any further questions? Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion on proof of work versus proof of stake? Well, um, I'm a big fan of proof of stake. Uh, I think uh, the, it's like the fever of blockchain tech and stuff. Like I think proof of work is inefficient, insecure, wasteful stuff. And um, I thought this for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I'm, uh, I don't know. I've been working on proof of stake actually. I worked with, I've been working and have worked on proof of stake for a very long time. Uh, and I'm fully like committed to it in a, also a deeply personally conflicted way. Where like sort of it's my baby and I, I'm never gonna let proof of work take it away, or whatever. But I, but but actually I do th I I do have one thing to say about that, which is, in this sort of proof of stake is better than proof of work, we sort of left no political prospect for miners, like the miners were sort of pushed off a cliff, and that was sort of actually politically not a very like not necessary. It turned out to not be a very wise move. At the time, it seemed smart because like, oh, we don't need these guys. They're just attackers or whatever. But like, uh, in the end, actually, uh, I think that the po the politics of switching from proof of work to proof of stake without giving miners a way to continue operating uh, was sort of a political mistake because there's a lot of miners out there, and they are sort of disenfranch they were sort of disenfranchised by the proof of stake thing. Uh, and I think that there's sort of like, you know, if we could do it all over again on different timelines or whatever, um, you know. Um, I think I think that another role, a productive role for miners that's compatible with proof of stake, should have been sort of set up first before proof of stake. But that's sort of like just to be politically nice to everyone, you know. And sometimes not always that easy because, like, uh, for example, the environmental cost of proof of work, uh, the security and 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 cost and tokens of proof of work, sort of, you know, 
is 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 hard to rationalize also uh just in order to save the miners you know what I mean? so 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 maybe it was okay to just like end it um the way we did uh, in ethereum anyways i'm thinking about ethereum i want to say, say a lot of stuff um so you know, I mean, I think proof of stake is the future, and everyone's going to move to proof of stake, and like because all the proof of work chains will be like attacked, basically, and secure. Um, however, uh, I do, I do think that the mi that miners, as like sort of commodified hardware professionals, let's say, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, should, we should think about them a little bit in this context, also, not just like pushing them to quit, just to be like politically aware of their sort of potential resentment and revenge that might come from that sort of uh, political choice. But what about the finality? Because one is deterministic and one is uh, probabilistic. Yeah, so, um, you know, finality is great uh, and uh, it is good for it to be deterministic also. I mean, um, but, um, you know, finality is necessary for proof of stake to work because of this sort of long range attack issue. Uh, whereas, like in proof of work, it's like impossible. You know, you're not supposed to have finality. I mean, you could have it, but it's sort of like against the philosophy or whatever. Um, you know, you can say there's finality if there's not too much, too many, uh, too many, too much hash power that's hostile and the latency is not too big and everyone's behaving nicely. But it's not really true in the sense that, like, oh, if there was more than that number of faults, then it could revert. Whereas in these proof of stake protocols. If the, even if the fault uh, fault assumptions are violated, the finalized blocks don't revert. Well, um, but how would you compare to proof of stake blockchains? I mean, which yeah. one is correct? Well, I mean, there. I mean, I mean, my proof of stake blockchain is correct by construction. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, which uh, one but, is sorry. the valid one? Uh, so, so I mean, look, uh, a proof of stake and proof of work are economic mechanisms for like reducing attack against these systems a uh, nakamoto consensus sort of minus the proof of work is actually very similar to the proof of stake blockchains that are you know except for like the packhouse drive ones uh and those are sort of very very similar in terms of the the basic mechanic of fork choice rule um and the, as a, and the speculative execution of the consensus protocol instead of this conservative let's all agree on the next block before it gets confirmed model and so i think uh i mean the way that i'd say it is uh you know like uh, Nakamoto consensus is sort of um, it's like a, a synchronous consensus, but this basic four choice rule and execution dynamic has been adapted in proof of stake into like asynchronously safe, but sort of like synchronous for liveness consensus. And so that basically means that like you know uh, it's very, it's actually very, it actually ends up being very similar in terms of the execution model. It's the economic model that's very different. And then the execution model, the main difference is actually the finality, actually. It's like the asynchronous, or you should be asynchronous finality in the proof of stake, whereas like uh, only synchronous finality in proof of work. And sort of only subject to false assumptions in proof of work, whereas in proof of stake is sort of absolute, but you might have consensus failure, where basically like if there's too many faults, different nodes have finalized conflicting blocks and therefore are sort of, yeah, they're final, but they're, but one of them is not sort of right or whatever. Um, so there, I mean, there are models, there are differences in the model, even that from the distributed systems perspective, but the differences are sort of much bigger economically, like in getting a miner versus getting a staker is a whole different uh, thing. And uh, mining is sort of higher barrier, higher barriers to entry, generally speaking, not for everyone, but for the most, for most people getting a coin, getting coins is easier than getting uh, mining power and uh, electricity. Uh, and so like, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm a big advoc advocate of proof of stake. Um, you can ask me more later. I can, I can, I can give you some more opinions about that. Actually, very interesting, very interesting stuff. Um, this is the, all this debate about like whether proof of stake makes Ethereum a security, whether like staking is a security, all this stuff. And you know, um, um, I, I would even I, I, now nowadays I even I just define proof of stake as like sort of a mechanism that uses securities. Um, basically, like a, a proof of stake is the use of virtual securities or like digital securities to permission the um you know they'll 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 catch up i mean um so so you know i mean uh it's it, you know the, the security sort of gives you the right to write in the consensus protocol it it even secures your weight in the consensus protocol um you know it's a it's a very very useful thing um and basically like basically the using securities instead of using computational power is sort of the model of proof of stake versus proof of work as an economic one you know you buy securities instead of buying computational power it's very simple so um 
yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk more about securities, but uh, um, uh, my time's up. My time's up, and also this is a, supposed to be a tech talk. No. Uh, Are there further questions? Yep. Hi. I should ask you about dunk sharding. Dunk sharding is next innovation in Ethereum. It's possible to provide the next level of the cloud computing based on decentralized processes and uh, work together with uh, classical cloud based on um, um, distributed computing process. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, unless uh, the data sharding has changed, it, it doesn't do uh, validation, it's just data availability. And so, um, you know, you could use it for something like data availability th thing. I also work on sharding and have competing sharding proposals, um, which I think are uh, better or whatever. I, I try not to, uh, my, the, my main objection with data sharding is actually the separation of validation and availability. So I, I like to have like the EVM native sending messages between shards, uh, sort of. Uh, really validating and everything. So for me, um, you know, like, I don't know, I guess it's like sort of like, like, um, simpler to implement. Uh, however, like, uh, you know, I think like, you know, like, like full messaging between shards and like full virtual machines on the shards sort of will be sort of available. 